Today, I want to talk to you guys about something that is very, very precious to me. Um, it's about how we as teams keep hurting ourselves in the same way. And it's something that is a pet peeve of mine. And it's something that has been annoying me more and more. And I've noticed that the problem is not really getting smaller. And to start talking about this whole uh, thing, we have to remember about what it is that we do. And we software developers are there to deliver software. And that software is there to provide, business, to provide value to the business. We deliver value. That's pretty simple if you put it like this. But then we get distracted. And we get distracted just like the magpie does. Now, you, you might all know about the magpie. Um, if you don't, it's a black and white bird with a pretty long tail. It, uh, its body grows up to about 45 centimeters long. Uh, it has a wingspan of about 60 centimeters. They are omnivores. They're pretty intelligent. And they're rumored to be attracted to shiny things. This is a very, very stubborn rumor, rumor that you find all over Europe. It's, this bird is rumored to steal jewelry, jewelry and stuff like that. And there are a lot of similarities between the magpie and the software developer. Now, we are not birds, but we're humans. Um, we might come in black or white or, or any other ethnicity. Uh, ethnicity. Uh, we don't have any tails. We grow up to about two meters tall. We don't have any wings. We're also omnivores. We're also pretty intelligent, and we're also attracted to shiny things. But in our case, these things are libraries, frameworks, architecture, stuff like that. And when we get attracted to these things, that's when we tend to punch ourselves in the face. Now, the, what we have to wonder is, why are we do, uh, attracted to these things? And why do we keep punching ourselves in the face? Because I don't really find that so surprising. Because we live in the software world. And in the software world, there is... Um, technology which constant, uh, constantly evolves. I mean, new frameworks, new libraries, new programming languages are invented almost every week. And unlike carpentry that we were talking about earlier, um, our profession is still very, very, very young, which means that we don't have a surefire recipe for success. We are still finding better ways to do things, um, and we are still finding out what a good way is to deal with a certain project. And our education about this is pretty limited. But despite these things, we all chose to be in software development, which means that we are people who like change, who like new challenges, who like trying out these new frameworks. And that's when we end up shooting ourselves in the foot. And if we look at our education, um, if I draw an analogy to um, construction, if you would go to school the way that we software developers go to school, you would get a course in laying bricks, a course in tiling, a course in constructing roof timber, a course in electrical wiring, and a course into piping. And after you've had these basic skills, they throw you into the work field, and what do they ask of you? Can you please design and build a house? And it might seem silly if I put it like this, this, but we expect our software engineers to know all of the disciplines that are involved with building a software systems, whereas our education doesn't teach them all these skills. And that's a bit of a problem. So when we get into the work field, we find ourselves overwhelmed and we look for guidance. And the places where we look for guidance might be conferences, just like this one. Um, where people from big companies tell their success stories and, and, and you look at them and say, okay, I'm going to try and do what they do. You go on the internet and you read blog posts and articles and maybe you read a, a book or whatever. Or you might look at the engineering efforts that are happening at the big companies, uh, maybe Stack Overflow or Facebook or Google. And Usually, the person on your team who follows all these, um, all these things is your most dedicated developer, and he brings all of those practices into your team, and you start doing what they do. And to understand how much pain that can actually bring you, we're going to go on a journey. 
Because we are going to run into a wall sooner or later. And to find out why we run into the wall, we're going to go on a journey with Chad. And Chad is a fictional character. He might seem like a bit of an asshole during these stories, but don't worry, he's not. And any resemblance to anyone you know is merely coincidental, okay? So bear with me. I'm going to shorten the stories a little bit because we don't have the full hour today. Um, but you will get the whole story um, if I tell them like this, okay? So Chad is a developer on our team, and I'm going to tell you a few things that happened when I was working with Chad. Now, the first story that I want to talk about is about RavenDB. And the solution that we were building looked a little bit like this. We had text files that were uploaded into our system, out of which we extracted about 70% of the data. And our project manager told us, okay, this is fine. We only need that 70%, but the rest of the data might prove useful in the future. And we might want to save these text files somewhere so that we can process them at a later point in time. And this is the task that was given to Chad. And Chad at the time was really, really passionate about RavenDB. Now, RavenDB, for those who don't know, is a document database. So what Chad did is he set up RavenDB on a new virtual machine. He started parsing the entire content of the text files and started uploading them as documents into the system. And that seemed like the perfect solution to him. But what went wrong is we found out really quickly that the price of RavenDB per gigabyte was pretty high. And we had to maintain the operating system. We had to maintain the database engine. But the most important problem was um, that the solution was pretty fragile. Because every time the format of the text files changed, we didn't have to only adjust our main processor. We also had to, um, we had to adjust the parser that Chad had written. And that, that solution was like a continuous upkeep for something that didn't provide us any business value at all because we were just saving this, this data for a possible point in the future where we um, would possibly need it. So what did Chad forget to check? He forgot to check if there was a technical fit for this solution. The question that you should ask yourself is, is this technology suitable to solve my problem? Is it the best one that we can choose to solve the problem that we are faced with? And you can ask yourself questions such as these. Does it really help me? How does it compare about competitors? Is there maybe something else that will help us more? Is this the simplest thing we can do? What are the costs that are coming with this solution? And what kind of maintenance upkeep are we looking at when we implement this solution? So if we circle back to RavenDB, RavenDB is a database, which meant that it's, it is optimized also to be queried. You can put indexes on it. You can uh, build projections into it. And all of these features we were not using but we were paying licensing fees for it, and we were basically paying system resources for all these things. So if we were not using most of RavenDB, it becomes a pretty expensive solution for what we needed. And it was not really a good technical fit. So if Chad, and this is what we ended up replacing the solution with, if we would, would have just used Azure Blob Storage or Amazon S3, you can just dump all those text files in there without parsing. You can just dump them in there. Um, the price per gigabyte is, is really, really low. You can have your data globally redundant uh, with a few clicks of, of, uh, of the mouse. I mean, and it's very, very, very robust. And that would have been a way, way better technical fit for the problem that we were faced with. So Chad learned about technical fit and he moved on to a next project. And at the next project, he was thrown in when the project had already been running for a couple of years. And it was an ASP.NET MVC solution. And the problem is that everything was, had become a little bit of a spaghetti. A lot of different developers had worked on it. Some um, contractors abroad had worked on it. And 
we basically had um, proxies of of our or um, li um, living all the way up into the views. And this triggered some n plus one selects. There was no clear separation to between business logic and UI logic and, and data access and everything. And this was really, really caused by some inexperienced developers working on this, but it led to a lot of problems. And the task that, that um, Chad had gotten was basically provide some kind of separation between the business logic and the view logic so that we can el start eliminating all of these problems. And it's important to know that this happened in 2014. We will see why later. Um, mainly because we didn't really have, uh, Angular wasn't really popular at that time yet, but also um, the solution that Chad chose caused some problems. Chad had worked with Akata in one of his previous projects. And Akata was basically a framework that allowed us to do just that. We could run it in process so, so it didn't complicate our deployment and it would allow us to apply a request response pattern inside our solution. And the cool thing about that is it solved basically um, the entire separation between UI logic and business logic. And that was, that was great. And since Chad already knew how to work with it, he knew that it was a correct technical fit to solve the problem. So he went ahead and implemented it. But not too long, long after that, we were confronted with this problem. And this is the commit history of Agatha. Akata was maintained by one person, and that person stopped maintaining it a year prior to us implementing it in 2013. And the problem is that at that point, the .NET framework was evolving quite a bit. We got async await support, which Akata did not support. Akata had some dependencies like a DI container and stuff like that. The dependencies were not updated and so on. The pull requests on the Akata um, repository were not getting approved. And that meant that this thing that we put at the core of our solution had become a liability. So what did Chad forget to check? Um, he forgot to check for warning signs. And this might seem trivial to you, but it's very good to think about why technologies can become a risk and how much effort you want to put into mitigating that risk, depending on how big a role this piece of technology is going to play in your solution. So you can ask yourselves, like, who, who are the maintainers of this library? Are there maybe multiple maintainers, which is always a good thing? Are they still actively working on it? Look at their commits, but also look at the blog posts that they're writing. If the main maintainer of a piece of technology is not blogging about it, but he's blogging about his new project, that might also be a warning sign because it might be that their focus is not in there anymore while you as a consumer of their library need it to be, right? It, can you access the source code? In worst case scenario, can you basically um, take a branch and, and start maintaining it yourself for the purposes that you need? Um, can you legally do so? Is there a license in place that allows you to do that? Um, and also a very big alarm bell is usually when a software product gets bought by another company because that is usually the moment where licensing terms change. And they do change. All of you who are, who are in the .NET ecosystem might have um, read a bit about the identity server uh, licensing model that changed recently. Um, it's their right to do so. They wrote the product, they are free to license it however they want. And it's your task to basically decide if that is something that you need to be careful about in advance. So what could Chad have done? He could have used Mediator, which is very, very similar to what Akata does. And it is actively maintained by Jimmy Bogert and it was still actively maintained in 2014. It was actually maintained by multiple people. There's multiple people who have lots of commits on that library, which is a very, very good thing. So that would have been a safe bet at the time. Now, would we have made the choice somewhere early 2013 that would have been unpredictable? So even if you do your due diligence for the risk factors, stuff might still happen that you did not foresee but it doesn't take a lot of effort to vet something that you're going to bring 
into your solution. So now that Chad had learned about technical fit and he had learned about warning signs, signs he dove into one of his next projects. And basically the, pro the uh, project that he was working on at the time was a pretty proper um, configured um, ASP.NET application. Um, there, it was coupled with another system through an event bus. Um, it, it was living, it was a really properly structured, uh, structured project. And he was tasked um, with building a proof of concept of adding audit trails to uh, certain pages. And he had a bit of a crush at, uh, on Greg Young at that time. So he was basically eating up everything that Greg was selling. So he figured like, okay, we have this event stream that I need to materialize at certain points in time. This screams event store. And that's right, because that was a technical fit and there were no warning signs at the time. So that was pretty good. And Chad dove into implementing event store for his audit trails. And it worked really well. He even wrote a wrapper around the actual event store stuff so that other devs could easily do the same things that he did. And he implemented his screen using the wrapper and everything went well. Now, what did go wrong is that the team contained a bunch of juniors and some remote contractors who were not working with us uh, in the same office. And none of those people had any event store knowledge. And which led to the point where um, nobody in the team actually touched any of the event store stuff except for Chad. And as this made its way into more and more and more screens, that meant that there were more and more and more screens that only Chad could work on. And that became a huge problem. Um, so what did Chad forget this time? It is getting the rest of the team up to speed. Your whole team needs to be skilled if you're actually going to actively use something. And there are a bunch of ways that you can solve team skills. Um, if you already have the knowledge, that's fine. Um, if you know what the product does and how it's meant to be used and what the pitfalls are, that's great. You can move on. But if not, you have to figure out if the knowledge is available and where you can get it. Documentation, tutorials, books, code samples, whatever. And then you have to think about how you're going to get the team up to speed. And that is a lot more than just giving a presentation about a certain technology. You have to build a proof of concept, preferably together with everyone. Um, and everybody needs to have the background to understand what is really happening. So that your, event, your, your eventual goal is to have everybody being able to work on the solution for implementing new features, for maintenance, stuff like this. And if you cannot check all these things, that means that you have to provide some time to basically build the skills of your team. So spread the knowledge. That is what Chad could have done. He could have taught the team. He could have wrote, written code together with them. He could have given a presentation. He could have organized a hackathon. He, he could have done so, so many things to get everybody up to speed. Now, this was a hard lesson for Chad, but he started doing it way, way, way better. And in, in another team where I was, um, there was a Chad and he was really the most respected developer on the team. And he was, um, everybody was looking in his direction. And that one day he came to me and he said, okay, we need to stop using Entity Framework. We should start writing our own SQL. We, we could maybe use a micro ORM like Tapper. And it is safe to admit that he was having a library crush on Dapper at the moment. Um, but at least he told me, okay, we, we got to refactor um, Entity Framework completely out of our solution. Which was weird to me because ORMs have traditionally be, been very, very good for CRUD applications. And our application was 99% CRUD. So it was a bit weird to me. So I dove into the questions with him and his frustrations were, Entity Framework is really slow. It does too many things. We have no control over the SQL that comes out of it. And the SQL that comes out of it is very messy. And I wouldn't disagree with him. I mean, 
entity framework is slower than writing your own hand-rolled SQL, and it does a lot of things, and you don't have any control. It's all true. But when I dove into it together with him, we figured out what, what the real problems were. I used a SQL profiler, a query plan analyzer. I used um, a performance profiler in the code, and we looked at what was actually happening. And the things that frustrated him were um, DB context initialization, just like a lot of ORMs, entity frameworks, uh, first DB context that gets initialized takes a long time because it needs to build its mental mapping model between the database and the code. But you only hit this delay once. So in production, this is not a real factor. But when you're debugging, you hit that all the time because what you do is you run something, you hit that, um, that delay, you figure out what's wrong, you kill the process, you fix your code and you run again and you hit that delay again. So what feels like an eternity in development is not something that's gonna cause you problems in productions. He had some N plus one selects going on. Um, they, these were really easily fixed by providing the proper included entities. Um, there were some missing database indexes and there were some places where he fetched entire objects where he should have only fetched two fields with a projection. Now, after I explained all of these things to him, it dawned on him that Entity Framework was in fact the proper solution and that he had not been using it correctly. Until that day, Entity Framework had been magic to chat. And as soon as he understood how it worked behind the scenes and how to properly use it, he actually became a fan of it. And the whole discussion about Dapper was off the table. So what should Chad have done is he should have taken away that magic for himself. And taking away the magic is a very, very good way to um, limit risks when you're importing new technology. Because if you understand how it was built and you don't have to be able to build the whole thing yourself, you just have to implement maybe one or two features to know what the developers who actually built this, what they had to use to get it done. And that will make sure that you use this technology in the right way and that you will not um, apply it incorrectly. And if you know how things work, um, that will make it a lot easier. You can do that by looking at the source code. You can do that by using profilers. You can um, try building a simple version of it yourself um, because then you will understand what the effect of your usage is going to be. And Chad got better and better. And he was transferred to a huge project which had been running for eight years. And this this eight years, um, it was a huge code base and Chad had been the lead developer now for a while and he did it really well. He was the superhero, the whole team admired his skills and he was the one who was always spending his free time learning and he always wanted to do things right. So when he found out something new that he wanted to introduce into the solution, he did so extremely well. When he learned a new way, a new framework, whatever, he explained it to the team. He gave a presentation about it. He explained what the good stuff about it was, what the pitfalls, pitfalls were, how the tips and tricks. He organized a hackathon. Um, he paired with people to get them up to speed and so on. And from then on, the whole team would do things like that, which is great. I mean, all of the things that we previously talked about, Chad applied in this, uh, in this team yet it still went wrong. And what went wrong was that they never took the time to refactor the old code. The old code stayed the way it was. And the result was that they had a solution with uh, four ways of doing front-end stuff and three ways of structuring back-end code and two different API frameworks and two different database engines and three ways of structuring the back-end code. And the cool thing is, if you, took at, if, if you took a look at the code of a certain feature, you could tell when it was written. Because if you know what they were using in the front end and the back end and which database, you could guesstimate like this feature was written like early 2017, just like the year rings in a tree trunk. 
And that's a problem because this had been uh, for the original team, this was not really a problem because they knew all of the stuff that they had used. But to bring somebody new into the team had become a huge pain because they had to learn all these things because all that code need, needed to be maintained. So you have to trim your stack and that is what Chad should have done. If something new goes in that replaces something old that you already had, you should also factor in the time to refactor the old code, especially if that code needs to be maintained for the future. And where you wanna end up is if you know how, which problem the new uh, piece of technology solves, you can ask yourself if you really need it, and if so, which old things you can replace. And estimate that the, estimating the effort um, of replacing the old framework is something you really, really have to do. Because the effect of keeping both will be huge on maintenance effort and it will be huge on onboarding new people. So if you keep your stack somewhat limited to what you need to get your job done, um, that is something that will really help you to not get stuck. And ideally, you would have a tree trunk that looks like this. The old technology gradually gets replaced by the new ones that are built onto it on the outside. Now, Chad had gotten a lot of these things right, and then he hit this huge greenfield project. And on this green sh greenfield project, he had the ability to choose his whole, whole stack. So he went wild. I mean, he got carte blanche to do whatever he, he wanted to do. And with his team, they decided like, okay, the correct way to do this nowadays would be to use Angular and we would use identity server and we would run Docker containers in a Kubernetes cluster. And yeah, a MongoDB would suit the best with the use case that we, we have. And a lot of these things were new to them and Chad sold it to, to them really well and he started training them on all of this. But the problem is that at some point the team got stuck. They got stuck on learning things. They got stuck on, on dealing with um, the more complex deployments. They got stuck on debugging stuff on their local machine. They got stuck on, on query patterns on MongoDB and the project got a huge delay, whereas it would have been due months ago. And okay, this is a massive team skills viola uh, violation and it is completely over-engineered for what this project needed. Now, if I wanna go back to team skills, this is something that you can learn from this project. If you have a hard deadline that you're supposed to be hitting and you wanna learn something new at the same time, you have to budget in the time to learn that new thing. And if you're combining learning goals and delivery goals with your team, that's going to be really, really hard. Especially if you try to learn five or six new things at the same time. Do them one at a time and explain this risk to the business. As I explain to them why you need this new te uh, piece of technology to, uh, technology to be in this solution, how it's gonna help you in the future, but that you need the time to do it correctly now. Now, Chad forgot here, um, aside from team skills, he over-engineered this massively. And this is something that I see happen in so many teams nowadays because we all look at Netflix and Spotify and so on. And we all start with microservices, but it's, it's really not necessary. And until you really, really need microservices, they get in your way. They make monitoring harder, they make deployments harder, they make um, debugging locally harder. Um, and as long as you don't reap the benefits from them, they will actually hurt you until a certain point. There are a bunch of, I, I always um, try to, the, the next slide is the bunch of things. Um, I always uh, try to keep my architecture as simple as I can get away with, which means that almost any project I start, I will start with a simple monolith, one deployment unit, whether that is a Docker container that you push onto a cloud provider, it doesn't matter. Just like one thing, push it. See what it does. See how users are responding to it. Find out what the real problems that you have are and solve those. 
you'll push a working project out the door way faster and you will be able to adapt to the exact needs that you have instead of some virtual needs that you come up with in the beginning of the project, which will turn out to be wrong anyway. And to come back to the matter of microservices, there is a certain scale that you need um, before you actually uh, dive into them. If you need to scale stuff independently, and I'm not only talking about the uh, performance scaling of certain parts of your solution, but also the development scaling, if you're one part of the solution needs a bigger team to be working on it, that might be a reason to go for microservices. If you need to support multiple clients with um, each having their own feature set, that would be a very good way of, um, a very good reason to choose microservices. If you need different technology stacks for different parts of your solution, another good reason to go with microservices. And if you have conflicting dependencies between different parts of your solution, that's also a very good reason. Apart from these, I haven't found any real reasons to do microservices. There are some reasons that we would like to believe, but usually they're not true. So if Chad would have just picked an easy architecture and a simple monolith and maybe added Angular or um, maybe added MongoDB as, as like their learning goal for this project, he might have still delivered it on time. Um, what you can always do, and I'm not going to dive into that because that's a whole other talk. Um, you can, inside a monolith, you can structure your code to allow decoupling. That's not really that hard to do. If you apply proper solid, solid if you build vertical slices, if you apply something like hexagon architecture or onion architecture, you will have a solution that is where it is pretty easy to extract a service from the monolith. And this is where you, um, in the future, will be able to reap the benefits of proper code structure. But focus on delivering your value. Um, take these six lessons into account, right? Make sure that what you're choosing is a technical fit to your problem. Make sure that there aren't any warning signs. Make sure that your whole team is up to speed and knows how the thing, work, uh, thing works. If necessary, take away the magic. Make sure that you understand what is behind it. Trim your stack, hollow out the tree trunk, make sure that you can bring new people into the team when you need them. And make sure that your, arch uh, your architecture follows your problems and not the other way around. Now, who is Chad really? I'm, I'm sure that you've all been wondering this. And in some of these stories, Chad was me. Um, in some of these stories, Chad has been the whole team or somebody else on the team, or I totally made him up. But what you can tell from all of these stories that Chad was not a malicious person. He did all the things that he did because he cared and he wanted to deliver quality solution. He was just a bit careless or helpless, right? And wouldn't it be better if instead of Chad's, we were all rat, responsibly acting developers? And this made me... Um, this, this pushed me to um, come up with the RAD certification program. So you can go to radcert.com and take a quiz. Um, you can follow RADCERT on Twitter if you want to. Um, and if we would be at a physical conference, I would be handing out these certification kits. But you can all get a rain check from me. If we ever run in, into each other in the future, let me know and I'll bring you one of these uh, certification kits with some stickers and a certificate. Um, it, the website is just a big mockery, um, but it, we are trying to get the word spread amongst developers so that we don't have any projects anymore where we are punching ourselves in the face. My name is Hannes. I'm the head of learning and development at a company called Access in Belgium. Um, I have three kids, as I told you earlier. I'm an amateur guitar builder. I'm a Lego enthusiast. This is my Twitter handle and my ICQ number. Make ICQ great again.